Hello there, system review time again. And today I'd like to review this little obscurity, the Amstrad GX4000. Mostly unheard of outside of the UK, mostly unheard of inside of the UK. It was Amstrad's attempt to enter the game's console market when it was all a bit too late. Very similar in vain to this, the Commodore 64 game system, which I have also reviewed. As you can see, it's about the same size as this, the Spectrum. So it's a little, little beast. It's the spiritual successor, I guess, to this, the Amstrad CPC 464, which is massive. And it has it's about as many game titles on it as this. So you can kind of see why it bombed. Let's take a look. Alan Michael Sugar Trading Limited, aka Amstrad, is renowned for following in the footsteps of others and either improving a product or remarketing it for an untapped area of a population. They did this with the CPC 464 range by taking a design which was very similar to the Sinclair Spectrum but then positioning it as an all in one, easy to use system, simply by bundling a compulsory monitor with each unit. Therefore, you'd probably expect their first console foray to be a similar affair. However, this was not quite the case. The console launched in September 1990 to a reasonably low-key delivery by Mr. Sugar. This was before he was a lord. During the delivery, Sugar was battered with questions over the 8-bit technology of the console, amid a market which had now been home to both the Amiga and Atari 16-bit machines for five years, and even more recently, the Sega Mega Drive. Sugar disregarded these questions with the comment, The technicalities don't matter, and it was a product, and what it does that count. And to be fair, the system did offer capabilities which were above the original CPC range, and even surpassed Sega's and Nintendo's 8-bit consoles. What wasn't taken into consideration was the buzz around bits. Now the word 16-bit used to strike up images of super graphics, ultrasound and blazing gameplay. Even by the late 90s, 8-bit was starting to look a bit long in the tooth. And regardless of the hardware sprites and extended colour palette utilised by the GX, it was still stuck in the world of 8-bit technology, and as a consequence, it suffered. The console launched at a pretty competitive price point of £99, similar to what the Commodore 64 GS would launch for just a few months later. Coupled with this, Amstrad launched a massive £20 million marketing campaign alongside the CPC 464 Plus and CPC 6128 Plus models, which were launched at the same time, and both featuring the compatible cartridge slot of the GX. This dwarfed the development cost of the console, which are estimated to be below £1 million, having been based on existing technology and following the traditional Amstrad method of designing the case first and then manufacturing the components to fit. This led to a small form factor machine which looks arguably futuristic and is incredibly light. But even this impressive marketing spend was not enough to stop the system from only selling 15,000 units. If you compare this to Sega's Master System which sold over 10 million units, it's easy to see that the machine was just too late to the market. If only they'd spent more of that advertising budget on development, we may have seen a drastically different story. Sadly though, this was unlikely to have happened. Amstrad's fortunes weren't what they were at this point in time, and Sugar had recently announced an ambitious initiative to produce one Amstrad product per month. The GX4000 was one of these products, and therefore given the time constraints it was always going to be a ME TOO product in the last minute bid to try and get into the console market. It's a story we're all too familiar with following Commodore's 64GS, Amiga's CD32 and Atari's Jaguar in the few years following. On launch, the system actually gathered some commendable reviews, with the popular CVG magazine describing it as a neat looking technically impressive console that has an awful lot of potential for just £99. Audio wasn't the best, but the chip was still comparable to what you'd find at the heart of the Atari ST, which, although praised for its MIDI music capabilities, didn't actually bolster a very good audio chip. The graphics were the main draw, however, with the GX capable of beating off similar priced consoles such as the Master System and the NES pretty easily. The tagline for the console played on this with the phrase, Bring the whole arcade into your home!
Technically, the system boasts a Zilog Z80A 4MHz CPU, similar to that found in the Master System, a whopping palette of 4096 colours, which outstripped even the Mega Drive's 512, 16 hardware sprites, 64KB of RAM, an AY38912 sound chip with 3 channels, a maximum resolution of 640 by 200 with two colours, or 160 by 200 with 16 colours, and 32 kilobytes of ROM. The system also had ports aplenty, with an audio output, two controller ports, an analog controller port, similar to PCs, a light gun port, a SCART video out, an RF video out, a power supply from an external PSU, and an additional power supply socket from the monitor if used. The system's controllers are very similar to what you'd expect to find with the NES and Master System in all their rectangular shaped glory. A quick flick through the manuals gives you the normal gumph, along with important messages such as treat the controllers with reasonable care. Pretty subjective, although thankfully they can take quite a beating. Now, the game lineup was sadly another blow for the GX's launch, with just not enough software available on the £25 cartridge format. Ocean stepped up as they did with the Commodore 64 GS, but many of the games were just direct ports from the CPC tape variants. People were just not happy to shell out five times the cost for a game which had been available for a number of years on an older system. This was a shame, as some developers praised the GX for its capabilities similar to that of the 16-bit Atari. With only the use of blocky colour pixels, which were handed down from the CPC, stopping it from looking as refined on screen to its 16 bit counterparts. Even some of the bespoke games, such as Copter 271, were frankly a bucket load of poo. And the good titles which existed, such as Robocop 2 and Pang, just couldn't make up for that shortfall. In a bid to win affections, Burning Rubber was shipped with every console to give immediate entertainment out of the box. It's actually a pretty addictive game with great graphics when you compare it to other 8-bit equivalents, uh, excellent sprite scaling and a pretty forgiving steering system which you can drive with one thumb if you so desire. The only problem with Burning Rubber was its placement in the box. It was slotted into the base of the polystyrene at the bottom of the box. Many customers failed to navigate this packaging successfully and complained about not being able to find it. In all, only 26 games were ever made for this machine, so rather than running through my favourites, here's all the goddamn games in one burst. Look at these office workers waving to the gunman. They deserve to be shot. Fancy title screen, terrible game. Now here's a weird one, your sole objective seems to be to kill little girls. Dick Tracy, dick being the operative word. This game's called No Exit, but it should be No Frickin' Control. Ah, an easy mission. Gather intelligence. Whoa, what, what, what the, what the f Worst ball physics ever? I know, right? 26 games and there's two freaking tennis games. This game reminds me of Werewolves of London, but this one is crap. This game isn't too bad! Oh, by the way, if you happen to own Chase HQ2 Special Criminal Investigation, then look after it, because only two copies are known to be in existence. You can't even download a ROM from Tinternet. 
So, with the machine being 25 years old, it's somewhat collectible now, especially given its limited manufacturing run. You can even buy a cartridge to slot in and download CPC games via SD card, much like the EverDrive system on Sega consoles. The system's availability in its launch countries of Britain, France, Spain and Italy lasted just over a year, with it being discounted to under £80 within 8 months and disappearing into the mist of time not long afterwards. This also led to some games, such as Gaza 2, never making it into production, although apparently some review code still exists somewhere today. Keep your eyes peeled! So then, that was the Amstrad GX4000. If you get a chance, snap one of these consoles up. Mine originally cost about 30 quid, and given the small size of the software library, they make an ideal collector's piece, even if you're unlikely to ever own Chase HQ 2. So, if that bothers you, it's probably best not to bother. See ya! Thank you for watching my review on the GX4000. Please subscribe if you haven't already, click another video below, and if you fancy supporting me, I've just started my Patreon channel, so feel free! We all like money, I like money, it helps keep the channel going. And on a serious note, it would be a massive help. But in any case, thank you very much for watching, and good night.